Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. I hope all's well with you. I think you're going to enjoy the show today. We've got uh, two segments of the show, and, and I think it'll be a very interesting one. We're going to go from a historical standpoint and, and go back in time, i.e., when one thinks about uh, the Lincoln Republican. Lincoln was a Republican, and, and uh, there's a lot of historical facts as it relates to what Lincoln was all about and during those particular days, i.e., minorities, African Americans. Too often people don't, they tend to not know what that history was all about. And the Republican Party has taken a real negative slam, if you will, from the standpoint of their lack of involvement with, uh, with African Americans and other minorities, if you will. And so we're going to revisit, if you will, that history with two people that I've known for a number of years uh, who also happen to be uh, members of the Republican Party, but also who have, uh, who are kind of like basically taking from, uh, from Michael Zach's publication called Back to Basics for the Republican Party. Let's put that right down there, Tom. And I've known Michael for some time, back to basic, that's one piece. And then another one was the, uh, during that particular time, happening, uh, there was another piece that was commissioned by former President Bush in uh, his presidency. It's called the Republican Freedom Calendar, uh, celebrating a century and a half of civil rights achievement of the party of Lincoln, which is very interesting, very, very interesting. And so we, around that discussion, we've got these two gentlemen here. Uh, we've got, we, we got a, a, a dear friend of mine, Dale, and TJ, uh, who have been around for quite some time in the Republican Party, one of which have run for office. In fact, we were on the same campaign trail at one point in time, TJ and I. Welcome, TJ. Thank you. Nice and to be then, here. And Dale and Sarah, his wife, you've seen him on the show, seen them, both of them on the show, and we spent some time in terms of um, uh, talking politics and a number of other things. Sorry, Sarah hasn't been here, but I understand she's back east somewhere, right? She's in Bend today. She's in Bend today, yeah. right? So yes. I'm sure she would love to be in. Yes, she'll yes, be she would. Yes, she she'll, would. She'll be to see the show. Okay, good. And so we're going to just sort of discuss that. And, and it's my understanding they've got another effort to try to educate, if you will, uh, not only the voting public, but uh, as typically as TJ, uh, I can still remember him how he he's so enthusiastic about getting the word out that uh, his, his mindset is to basically get this, uh, get this discussion going throughout these United States and the world. I mean, you know, he may, he may have a satellite sitting up there, <laughs> TJ. I know it's, because I think the, the, the last time I remember the satellite concept was that when he was running for office, TJ had several oh, used cars and he would basically mm -hmm. park them in various yes. areas and just kind of put them all over the place. And that was good. Uh, it's unfortunately, he might not have won, but sometimes you can win by losing it because the fact of the matter is he's still on the table. He's still out there fighting for the rights of the, of the people of Oregon and, and elsewhere. And so, again, I want to thank you for the involvement that you've had, TJ, and, and your, your continued spirit and enthusiasm as to the efforts. And this new venture is something else. We're going to have that discussion. And then the second, second half of our show, we're going to be talking with uh, Jody Weiser. Uh, she's founder of Tax Fairness Oregon. And again, that's another interesting piece. Uh, my old dear friend David Saracen did a piece in the Oregonian editorial page. You can check it out. Uh, it's about ballot measure 84, which is interesting. It's, a, it's called the debt tax or the estate tax or whatever. But I thought it would be interesting to, to talk to someone who, who could, in essence, it could have taken advantage of this situation. But, but in her particular situation, she says, oh, no, I'm just on the opposite end of the deal. And we're going to spend some time with her and get a good feel of, of what, um, what she means by that and get a better feel of what that means and, and why it's important to maintain its present status or why it's not. So with that, that's our second half, and so stick around. So with that, well, guys, welcome. Good to be here. Okay, good. So why don't we start off uh, with, uh, you know, the other things you I was thinking about is that, and that's why Dale and I, we'd sort of gotten together early on. I'd asked that question about the association with the Tea Party I, I identified with the Republican Party. That's always been a kind of an issue. I remember when it first started, you know, from the standpoint of what the Tea Party was, and everybody sort of got involved because it was kind of like a, an issue that everybody was sort of concerned. and then you know, went through that process. And so now to date, it has sort of somewhat of a negative connotation. You know, people put sort of a negative from the standpoint, talks about uh, the racist and all this other good deal and whatever. But but I know that um, there's been some involvement with, with Dale and others and like yourself and whatever. That was not the intent. I know better than that. So I thought maybe this would be an opportune time to kind of, let's talk about that. Let's first start off by, let's de define, if you will, 
uh, your initial involvement with the Tea Party and what that meant to you during that particular time. Dale, want to start off? Well, I think um, the, it's kind of, you fall into this trap where the left tries to define their opponents, and it's, we, we, we found it was a deliberate tactic of the left to identify those in, involved with the Tea Party as racists or, um, or whatever they want to, you know, try to say. It's, it, it's not true, obviously. Um, that's not to say there's maybe not some element of it in some area of the country if you looked hard enough and scrutinized it enough as there are in any groups there are people that are, that, that do things for different motivations but I know the the concern that most Tea Party members have is uh, and this is why they got involved is they see that unsustainable debt you know they see what other countries are going through like Greece and Spain and Ireland where they're literally going bankrupt we have entire cities in this, this own country where they've they've overcommitted overspent and, and it's not sustainable. The future, they care, care about the future of the, of the country. So they've stepped up in the time of their country's need to, to say this is not, the, the direction our country is headed is not the way we want it to go. So they're, they're doing the only thing they know of to do is to try to engage many of them from the first time. And it's various different political parties, um, Republicans, independents, libertarians, dem even Democrats. Mm -hmm. And so as far as what you bring up from the, from the Tea Party standpoint, it's not, it's, it's definitely a, a tactic of the left to try to marginalize those. And of course, they're saying, they're, they go as far as to say, well, it's because there's a black president. Well, it's, that's, that's patently absurd. Mm -hmm. So does that answer your question as far as from my, my involvement or others' involvement in the Tea Party in, in this country? Okay. TJ, what do you think? <clears throat> What's your, what would be your I, defense? I'm, I'm happy to see that the Tea Party is alive and well. And I, th I think their, mes their message resonates with the average voter. It, it really does. Um, one of the mistakes that the left has made is to think that they can prop up the, uh, our economy by having all these, these subsidies and all these special programs. And, and I, I tell my friends, you, you know, you, you can't uh, fix the economy by having a stimulus program. And, and the story I tell is, is like um, what I call the second chapter of Jack and Jill. So you, you know the first chapter. You know, Jack and Jill went up the hill. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, the second ch chapter doesn't end much better. So now Jack and Jill are teenagers, and they're living at home. And they both want money like teenagers do. So Dad says, well, uh, Jack, I got an idea. If you'll mow the lawn and take out the garbage, I'll give you $200 a month. And Jill, if you'll do the dishes and the laundry, I'll give you $200 a month. Now that you both have an income, I'm going to need you both to pay me room and board at $100 a month. And that way, we're all going to have an extra $200 a month. <laughs> and, that, and that's what our stimulus program is. Now, of course, the Tea Party would tell you our stimulus program is nothing more than political payouts, which, which it is. But if you, bring it, if you bring the argument down to the a household income, you see very clearly it, it would never work. Mm -hmm. The government says, look, we've got all these extra people working, so now we've got more tax revenue. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's, it's true. It always works until the bills come due, okay. just like it would in your own, in Jack and Jill's household. It'll work, but not once the bills comes comes due. Now you're in trouble, and you're worse off than you were before. Okay. Well, let me throw this out on the table. Most Americans identify the Tea Party as the Republican Party. Fair, fair statement. Sure. I being involved, it, it, you can't identify it that way. May, most Americans may do that mm -hmm. because the antidote to these what I call collectivists mm -hmm. that have a vested interest in expansion of government and more and more dependents, like, like TJ mentioned, those who are ha dependent on handouts from the government, the antidote is to, to restrain that. And sometimes the only op op option is to, to vote against the, the, the candidate that represents the left. That would be the party of Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid. So, so as far as... Um, no, but I, it's not true. There's, there's, I'd say probably one third of the entire movement are independents, and then one, probably one quarter are libertarian, other parties, mm -hmm. and I'd say less, about half, less than half, probably, if you break it down, are actually Republicans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, what part of the Tea Party do you think, uh, in terms of Republican, Oregon Republican, if you will, how do they relate, if you will, to the, to the Tea Party? Any, any, any thoughts? Any thoughts on that? Uh, it's kind of a, it's, it's, in some cases it's a symbiotic relationship okay. in the sense that you may bump into others that are involved 
in the political in the political parties, mm -hmm. including the Dem Republican Party. But it's not like there's any co very little coordination. It's kind of like everybody's doing their own their own thing, and mm -hmm. they bump into each other occasionally, but but not not in any organized deliberate way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the other thing too, Dylan. I do know that you and Sarah are kind of like you, yeah, there's another organization that you've identified with, if you will, that that sort of like talks to issues across the board. Mm -hmm. What is that? What's the name of that organization? Well, the issue that we're involved, the group we're involved with, is um, is a, as volunteers, I might right, add. Right. The funny thing of that, again, is the left has tried to say we get money from the Koch brothers. It's Americans for Prosperity. Okay. But as as far as on a local level, we're all volunteers, and everybody in our group are volunteers. In fact, we could argue we pay to do it. But the reason why we do it is because the issues are are close to home. You see, you see group groups like Metro. Um, it's any time government becomes a force that's limiting individual rights. Uh, our our forefathers in the Constitution gave us the tools to oppose that, and that is is freedom of speech, our Bill of Rights, to address our government, and that's what a lot of the the, the, the efforts we've had have been limited to what we can do um, with our Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. But why not take the label of the Republican Party? Are these, are these not issues that the Republican Party should be discussing, or the Democratic Party? Uh, the Tea Party would have, would would object to that they wouldn't they don't want to be identified or affiliated with Republican political Party. parties uh, some in the group do but they're not right. they're not the ones that have the final say okay so. okay tj you want to add into that at all uh, anything no. you want to say nothing everything's okay everything's good all right good good mm -hmm. good now let, let's get down to this this uh, this the idea of going back in history and time talking to uh the uh uh, the relationship that the Republican Party had, i.e., during the Lincoln era aspect of it, as it relates to minorities and others. Okay, uh, it has been said that in many ways, uh, from a historical standpoint, that Republicans were very, very much involved with uh, uh, with minorities. And when one starts thinking about African Americans, you think about the um, uh, the Revolution and and how blacks and whites were basically fighting together, you know, et cetera, and the whole issue of the Buffalo Soldiers and this, that, and the other, and whatever. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. We, uh, we're, we're very familiar about Lincoln, right? And uh, when, I, when I think about Lincoln, I also think about uh, bringing it even more current. When I, can, I remember when, when, when President, President, President Obama, uh, when, he, uh, when, he was, uh, when he made his nomination, if you will, when he basically wanted to run for office, when he, when he filed, he filed on the steps where Lincoln was, you know, Democrat Lincoln. But yet and still, when that happened, I... Uh, for some strange reason, the Republican Party didn't jump up and say, "Hey, wait a minute, uh, is he Republican or not? What's the deal?" Fair. Mm -hmm. Nothing. nothing Nobody uh -huh. said anything. Well, um, <laughs> you, you talk about Lincoln. Yes. Uh, now, I I think that people have a wrong opinion of of Lincoln and what he did um, for the blacks. Now, now it's true that he he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, but were you aware that it wasn't his issue? The freedom, freedom of the slaves was not, it was not his, his issue. Um, this book you've got on the table uh, outlines that, and I didn't know this until I read the book. Mm -hmm. But uh, Lincoln didn't care if some of the states had slaves, all the states had slaves, or none of the states had slaves. It wasn't his issue. It was the issue of the Republican Party. The Republican Party was the one that pushed Lincoln into signing the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. and, it, as, and every time you put the focus on Lincoln did this for the for the black people, you take the focus off the Republican Party. It was a movement of that party mm -hmm. that said, hey, we don't like what's going on. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was the Republican Party that built schools in the South to educate the blacks and the poor white minorities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, we, we're out of the game. I mean, what happened? It looked like it just sort of reversed to the Democrats. It looked like the, the, it basically the Democrats took the lead. Well, if you tell a lie long enough, <laughs> I mean, people I start. Even pe people today. start to believe the lie. I mean, the Republican Party has over 200 years of history of supporting um, uh, blacks, minorities, uh, uh, helping people try to try to better themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, as we as we talk this stuff, because we're going to get right into this this business card that you gave me not too long ago. Uh, president Bush made an attempt. Former President Bush made an attempt in 2005 to publish this. Republican Freedom Calendar, and I picked this up at the convention when I went to, to New York, and it was a very interesting calendar. 
and it basically talked to, uh, from a historical standpoint, of all of the minority involvement and achievements that the Republican parties were involved in. And I think we talked about this once before, that even there at the convention, uh, there was sort of a uh, let's not hand them out type routine. I just happened to have gotten one and got very excited about the fact that this, this had happened. And, and, but so, and it just stayed in New York. It didn't, it didn't go around the country for that matter. And as you know, I, I came back here and I started distributing these. And for some strange reason, it didn't take on, okay? And it's a very valuable piece. And, and even to this date, for that matter, you know, when you start thinking about um, Mexican Americans, you know what I mean, that are basically, they, they are part and parcel of whatever, and they are also part of this and the outreach, and you know, think about the immigration reform, and I think about a number of things that Republican parties initiate, but unfortunately, we don't get the, uh, the Republican party doesn't get the, uh, hey, we did it all, mm -hmm. fair? <clears throat> okay. Absolutely. So now I understand you've got an effort now. Uh, you, you've got now the George Washington, this is not just myoregonrights.com. Let's talk about that. Now, what, 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 let's define that. What are you trying to do? Okay, well, let's, let's go back to, to why I, I put it together. Um, when I ran for the Oregon State Senate in 2006, um, I knocked on over 15,000 doors. Right, I remember that. And, and the second people found out I was Republican, they hated me. And, and, what I, and what I began to understand was that the people didn't understand what the Republican Party truly represented. I mean, the, the left did a marvelous job of singling out one person from the party and saying that this is what the entire party represents, which is just absurd. That's like saying, well, you had a black man that robbed the 7-Eleven, so therefore all blacks are, are thieves and, and robbers. I mean, you, you can't make that, that statement. That's, that's not fair. And, and that's what the left has done to the Republican Party. The Republican Party has over 200 years of history of supporting blacks, minorities, um, and fairness and equal rights among all Americans. No, why aren't they championing this? Why is there a problem? I mean, I, I can, you, can talk to, you can talk to older blacks like myself back when, you know, even in a segregated society. They knew about this history. They knew that, the, the, you know, my father, for that matter, was a Republican back in the early days. Mm -hmm. But today, no way. If you tell a lie long enough, people begin to believe it. So what is the party going to do to try to bring it, make it straight? Talk well, about it. Okay, so, so um, because of what I experienced at the door, mm -hmm. what I experienced in, in hate mail and phone calls when I ran as a Republican, um, I, I put together a website called My Oregon Rights. Mm -hmm. And the website is de dedicated to telling the history of the Republican Party. I mean, the true history, not, not the slanted history you get from the media. Okay. And so if you go to that website... I, Put I, this on the screen, Dave, will you? Again, that's, that's my history, uh, www.myoregonrights.com, right? Myoregonrights.com. Myoregonrights.com. Okay, that's what we're doing right now. He's talking about this right now, and it's my understanding you can go to this website and it starts talking about this whole history. Right, right. There's, there's a quiz you can take on the website. It's, it's a fun quiz because um, you're going to get the right answer. Mm -hmm. Because if you get the right answer, wrong answer, it'll say try again, and you get the answer again. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very informative quiz. It's a fun quiz. Um, in fact, the, the first thing on, on the business card says George Washington's middle name was what? Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, most people don't know what his middle, middle name is. That's on the quiz. It, it's kind of fun. Um, it's, it's a fun quiz. And you'll learn a lot about the Republican Party that, that even people that are running for office don't know. I mean, I, this year I've been traveling around the state meeting different candidates, and I've asked them some of these basic questions. You know, uh, can you tell me this? No. Can, what about this? I don't know. I mean, we've lost our, our history and our identity. But should that not have been part of our history? I mean, it's not taught in schools. I mean. We've got Republicans, in, we've gone through various nominations in this, that, and the other education process. Don't you think that would have been very, very important in our classroom for young people coming ahead of them? You would think so. Why, yeah. why is it? Why, I, why I, went to, I, went, I went to a private school. I was taught that in private school. In private school? In private school. Not public school? Not public school. Interesting. Hmm. Well, why not? Well, what's it? Why, why don't we take it? So we, this is what you're doing it right now, right? We're doing right. this right now, okay. And, you, and I take it the, uh, the local chair of the Republican Party feels good about this. He does. He does, he does. feel good about this. So, he does. So it's some, something's going to be done about this piece. Right. Okay, now what about our, uh, our president who's, who's running now? I mean, actually, uh, uh, 
Governor Romney, does he, does he, is he aware of this particular issue? Uh, I don't think. This, this website was just recently Did launched. Put together? Okay. I mean, this, this is just the ground floor of launch of, of the website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is history. You understand what I'm saying? Right. This has been there for years and years. Fair, fair, right? right. But for some strange reason, we're reluctant to put it out there. Yeah. One, one of the questions on, on the website is, uh, that you go to is, is, who is responsible for the 1964 Civil Rights Act? And, and if, in fact, if, if you go to the De Democratic National website, the Democrats take credit for it. By like how? Who, like well, the, who? well, the reason they take credit for it was President Johnson mm -hmm. signed the bill. Mm -hmm. well, it, who initiated it? But it, it was the agenda of the Republican Party for the previous 200 years. Okay. In fact, most people, and, and, and all this stuff you can Google, and, and people tell me, oh, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. I said, Google it. it, it and you can Google all, all the stuff that we're talking about. It, it's out there. It's, it's not hidden. Um, the other thing they don't know is that when they were discussing this bill, this 1964 Civil Rights Act, that the Democrats had filibustered the bill for 83 days. They didn't want, they didn't want it to come to a vote. And when it did finally come to a vote, a greater percentage of Republicans voted for it than did Democrats. But yet the Democrats are taking credit for it. You know, similar to the to the, the same situation where, where we like to say, well, well, Lincoln was responsible for ending slavery. He wasn't. It was a Republican Party. Well, he was part of it. He was, he was talked into it. But he was still part of the Republican Party. He was a Republican. He was a Republican. But so he's but part it, of it. But it wasn't his issue. So who was it? Who was it? It was a Republican Party's issue. Give me a specific. Give me a name. A name? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know a name. Well, the name just, now is Lincoln. I mean, I'm, saying, I'm just saying it's associated with Lincoln in many right. ways because he was he's running for president. He was right. president to a particular time. I'll give me an example of that, folks, as I, as I talk about this. It says the Republican Party, in the, I'm taking this from right from the issue here. It says the Republican Party, 150 years of advancing civil rights, and this is very historical. It says to stop the Democrats' pro slavery agenda, anti slavery activists founded the Republican Party, starting with a few dozen men and women in. Ripon, Wisconsin, on March 20, 1854, the party spread across the northern and western United States like a prairie fire of freedom. The first Republican state convention was held in Jackson, Michigan, in July 1854. The Republican National Committee met for the first time in 1856, followed four months later by the first Republican National Convention. I mean, that's a, that's a very historic, that's a historical fact. And in all due respect, it should have been taught in school way back when, but it was never picked up. Well, whether it was political on both sides of the deal, but the fact of the matter, it was there. Now, now this is another significant fact. This, this is a very, very powerful piece. It says the first Amer African American senator and representatives in the 41st and 42nd United States Congress, from top to left, represented Rob. I mean, these people were all from Alabama, from Georgia. These were African Americans that were elected to Congress during those days, back in those days. That's a very huge situation. And in all due respect, it should be in our educational system. Unfortunately, it's not. You know, and and uh, and I guess this is a very very powerful piece, and that history is good. And so, TJ, you're right on the right track. I take it this is going to be all part and parcel of some of the things you're going to be doing. I, I think about wall builders too. Wall builders was was another area that that's that's on online. If you looked at wall builders, you'll find a lot of this these historical facts. Is that going to be part of the inclusion? Oh yeah, absolutely. And. and one of the other things that the left has done a marvelous job is, is they're continuing to spread the lie that the Republicans were, um, were the Ku Klux Klan operatives. I mean, that's, that's one of the lies they tell. It was that, just that, the opposite. It, it's just the opposite. I mean, it was the Democratic Party that started the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, it was the Republican Party that passed laws to, to try to rein them in and stop their activities. Hmm. So why, why is it that the Republican Party not putting that out on the table? They should be out there in those neighborhoods saying, "Hey, here it is. These were these were were were, were Klansmen and I freed you. What's the deal? What's the problem?" I don't know what the problem is. But you're going to do it. I'm going to do it, and I am doing it. Okay, and you're doing I, it. Through. I, I've I've got friends and relatives that are spreading the message that are uh, putting this this website on Facebook. They're emailing it to their friends, and it's, and it's starting to spread. I mean, we're seeing people viewing this website from all over the country right now. Well, we're having a major election right now. I think that should be on the table. I'm not trying to take anything from either kind of candidate, but this needs to be a discussion because that's one of the problems we're, we're having in this country today. And, and I'll, I will say one thing, that we're fortunate to have had 
the first African American elected the president because now we're able to discuss the issue. Mm -hmm. And now it's on the table. And so I think what you're doing here now should be on the table that both entities should be talking well, about. Here, here, here's the deal. If, when I ran for state senate, if a person didn't like me, I wanted them not to like me because of who I am, not because of some misunderstanding of the party I belong to. So if a, if a person understands what each party represents and they understand the values of each party, and the true values of each party, and then they want to vote Democrat or Republican, then God bless them. But don't be voting against me because of some misconception you've got about the Republican Party. That's not right. Well, like I said, you got to educate them. You just got to educate people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just coming from someone running for office, then they're just, just i.e., just kind of like pleasurizing yourself, mm -hmm. right, so to speak. But when I ran for the state Senate, um, the Republican <laughs> caucus told me not to put the word Republican on any of my materials. When I, when I filmed a, a television commercial, the word Republican was never even on the commercial because of the marvelous job that the left has done to define what a, what a Republican is, which are all lies, hmm. absolutely all lies. Well, just the opposite. As you know, I've, I've run for office in this state for a number of times, and, and I've always identified myself as a Lincoln Republican. The whole idea is for them to go back and check into that history, if you will, because I think it's a very, very important time during this particular time and how African Americans participated in the building of this country as opposed to just slaves, because in all due respect, uh, I've, I've come out with a whole new little definition now uh, in regards to the, and talk to America. Remember now, uh, the, the, the slaves, if you will, were basically sent here and sold by African chieftains. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the poor whites, if you will, were basically sent here by Europeans. So the definition of America, white Americans and black Americans. And, and during the revolution, white Americans and black Americans fought side by side. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm putting in sort of a late term aspect of it, but I think that has some, some merit, if you will. That's, and, that, and that's why I tend to try to attribute your educational situation in terms of justifying the statement that I just made. It's very, very important. Yeah, earlier we were talking about the, uh, the Tea Party, and one of the, one of the issues of the Tea Party is the balanced budget amendment. Mm -hmm. And if, if, you, if you look back on the history of the balanced budget amendment, um, it was always a re Republican Party that was pushing that balanced budget am amendment. And it was always the, the Democrats that blocked it every time. Hmm. Every single time. But the Republicans have just never had enough votes um, in Congress to get that done. And, and, and then what's, what's, the, what's the end result of a, a budget that's not balanced? The end result is it enslaves everybody. Well, you know, now America, most Americans don't, don't, don't feel comfortable about any elected person mm -hmm. in Congress today, whether you are or are D. I mean, they're sort of down in, what, 10 to 15 percent by the support aspect of it. David? Well, this, this comes back around to yes. they're told a lie right. and they believe it. I'll, right. gi I'll, no, I'll give you another example that I was thinking about while TJ was talking. There's the left, as it's constituted in Oregon, of course, the Democrat Party, is a coalition of, of dependent groups. It includes people that are dependent on, uh, directly on government, and it's, it's, it also includes another dependent class, not, not to exclude government themselves, but hard, hard left groups such as the environmentalists. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, a good example of how you could, you could get people, whatever their ethnicity, off of government's dependency is to give them a job. Um, the coal industry wants to ship coal through the Columbia, Columbia Corridor. And they're, they're saying it would bring between three and 5,000, actually, actually, no, it's been revised, 7,500 jobs to the region. Okay. Okay, now, as you know, Oregon, it's one of the highest um, dependent on, on food stamps. It has like one out of every five or one out of every six Oregonians are dependent on food stamps, mm -hmm. in addition to all the other government handouts. Okay. What is the best thing to do to get people off of government? Give them a job. So, here the environmentalists are trying to make up all of this myriad of, of, of um, arguments to oppose the coal industry, saying the dust might come off the, the barges or the trains. Uh, the diesel emissions, never mind diesel everywhere we drive, but the diesel might be uh, cause asthma. Or, and, and their whole theory is predicated on the issue that they believe in, which is their belief that there's global warming. Not to say there's not issues with the climate, but it's not it's been very, very, very up for debate whether that's at all related to carbon emissions. And, and, and that's been proven by the cover-up with the, the emails with the, uh, the, the, the UN emails where they said we can't let any of this data out that, that contradicts our, our thesis because we've got a whole 
department dependent on government. And that comes back around to what, when Romney had mentioned about a month ago about the 47 percent. That's not just people directly dependent on government as far as the poor. That includes crony capitalists, uh, government, working with, with um, capitalist industries that get money from directly from the government. That's pa that taxpayer money. The government can't afford to keep opening up the tre treasury to every business that wants a handout from government. So that, that there is a dependent class, and it's not just the poor. And that's why what TJ was saying here, we've been li the, 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 the right, as I would ident identify with, with respect to the Republican Party, the Tea Party, the right has been told that we don't care about the poor, we don't care about this, or we're racist, when what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, let's have some sane policies. You, this is not sustainable. $16 trillion, that's a real number, Bruce, that you cannot keep borrowing from China, and now even China won't loan us the money. Now we're printing the money. Every despotic regime you see across the world went down the same path where they start printing money, which basically means the money is going to be eventually worthless. You can't just keep printing money to pay off your dependency, whether it's the environmentalists, the crony capitalists, that's industry working with government that are dependent on government. You see a lot of that here in Portland. It's, I would say, the poster child for <laughs> the crony capitalists. And I can name names, but I would rather not today on your show, but you know who, the, you know who they are if I started naming their names. It's like they've got these partnerships all the way, and then usually Metro's not far off. And so back to this issue, if you can unleash the private, in, private en enterprise in Oregon, it would be starting with, not limited to, the coal industry to ship their coal. Guess where they're going to ship it to? They're going to ship it to China anyway. Then you, you create jobs. You create people that have an incentive to work where they can, where they can have you know, self-worth rather than just sitting home getting a check from the government. No, most people don't want to do that. Most people I want to provide for their families. They want to have a future, which they won't have if you, if you ha have a country that's not free. You don't have a future. It's just the way it works. Greece, do you think they can even have a say in their own elections now? Going, when a country goes bankrupt, Bruce, it's very serious because other people pick your leaders. Other people pick what, what you're going to the future of your country. And I, I don't think most people, when they when they um, have an opportunity to look down the road 10, 20, 30 years down the road for this, our country, they would want to say that we, we did what we could to maintain our independence. That's why our whole country was founded, was to be independent. And the Constitution is our, our, our foundation that should be preserved. So, now, I, now, you were talking about environmentalism. <clears throat> now, most people don't realize that the Republicans have been in the forefront of responsible environmentalism. In fact, do you, know, do, you know, do you know who started the, the uh, EPA? It was President Nixon, a Republican. He, he started the Environmental Protection Agency because he realized that we needed responsible protections for our environment. In fact, do you know, do you know who, um, who, who, uh, who got uh, Yellowstone, not Yellowstone, um, um, yeah, Yellowstone National Park? That was a re Republican agenda. We Republicans put that park together to preserve it for, for um, people for many generations to come. You know, I, I feel good about what you say, but at the same time, we've gotten so sophisticated today. Why is it that can we, we can't just say, okay, fine, what's going what's gonna to better our way of life? And if you happen to be a Republican, a Democrat, or independent, the bottom line is that it's better, bettering Americans, if you will, across the board. Now, the left, that, left has gone so mm -hmm. far with this environmental thing is, is they, they focus on one little part of the planet and they don't see the entire planet. And then that's the divide. And, and I'll give you an mm -hmm. example of that. We have a, we have a, um, a business in um, Central Oregon, and Senator Ted Ferrioli was, was telling me about this, that, that the, um, the government said you have to reach 100 percent co compliance or you can't do business here. Now, th now, this industry came back and said, look, we can get to 90 percent and, st and still be profitable, but to make us 100 percent, um, we, we can't do it. We're, we're going to go bankrupt. So they're in the process of shutting this industry down um, because they can't totally comply. So when they shut this industry down, guess where we're going to get this product from? We're going to get this product from China. Mm. And what kind of environmental... Through, excuse me, friend, but through a middleman from here. Yeah, and so, and, and so mm -hmm. what, what kind of it, yeah, good point? What kind of environmental restrictions does China have on their manufacturing? Mm -hmm. None. Mm -hmm. They don't have have anything. And so so the greater picture is what's going to happen to our planet when when we could have had a, a company here providing jobs at and we could have had them ninety percent responsible environmentally, 
and now we've shut them down, and now we're getting the product from China, which is polluting the entire earth. It doesn't make sense. Well, look, guys, we, we get, like I said, we could probably go on and mm -hmm. on, but I, I think the idea of what you're trying to do is a good thing, if you will, and hopefully you can, someone on the other side of the aisle, they might be able to duplicate that and say, okay, fine, what are we doing for America, if you will, and, and, do, and doing the right thing, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think this is a good thing, and, and I would hope and, and would encourage folks to, to, to go on and, and go on to www.myoregonrights.com and, and check take out the quiz. And, and take the quiz and see what's going on and maybe even ask a Democrat to do the same thing, to do the same thing. And then maybe at some point in time we can put them all together and merge them together. And then at the end of the day, it's what can you do for America? Fair? Absolutely. Fair enough. Absolutely. Well, look, guys, uh, why don't we do that? And, uh, and I appreciate the fact that, that this is also part and parcel included because it's a very, it's a very serious issue in this country. And I think it's very, very important that, that we outreach to other Americans who happen to be of minorities and let them be an inclusive. So then at the end of the day, we're all Americans, and we happen to be all of these various cultures. Fair? Absolutely. So thank you very much, guys. It has been great. We're going to take a short break, and then we're going to be back with our second guest. Thank you. Thank you you got to get, come back, if you will, and give me a little update on this, maybe by another month. All right. That's okay. fair. Okay, Absolutely. that's good. Sounds good. Thanks, DJ. Thank, thank you. All right, we're going to take a short break, and then uh, we'll be back with our second guest. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Look like we're back, and we're just going to get right into the show. Um, I might, I might add too that uh, this particular topic we're going to talk about Measure 84 with Jody here. She, uh, Jody, Jody is the founder, if you will, of Tax Fairness Oregon. Jody Weiser, and uh, but it was so interesting about it that we talked about you coming on the show last week, and then my dear friend David Saracen from the Oregonian and the editorial page wrote an article about it. It was a very interesting article. And it sort of educated folks about that because too often you, you tend not to talk about the money type thing, you know, the measure, mm -hmm. the estate taxes, and what does that mean, and why are people so concerned about this way and that way and this, that, and other. It really opened up my eyes about this piece, but better yet, you're here. You're a real person, and you two have gotten uh, in, involved in this process, and we're going to now get a little better feel of what, what it really is as opposed to just another writer. Like mm, David, and, okay. I, and David's good, okay. And I'll just, I'll just throw out just the first paragraph, just kind of give a sense of, of what, where we're going with this. It, it says, Measure 84, a suspicious death case without a body. Again, this is a Sunday Oregonian. Okay, that's today, okay. And it's October the 7th. And David uh, wrote this article, and uh, you can also reach him, by the way, at 503-221-8523 if you want to talk to him a little bit more about it. But I'll read the first paragraph, which I thought was pretty cool. It was a major advance for conservatives and language reinventors when in the 1990s this estate tax was redefined as the death tax. Since everybody dies, it made the tax seem far more threatening, although not that many people die in possession of more than $1 million. And so with that, I said, but Measure 84 on the Oregon ballot this November goes far beyond merely redefining the death tax. 
I, I think Kevin Mannix was the one, uh, our dear friend Kevin. Kevin used to be at one point in time chair of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And he does write a number of bills and he's got supporters along the line. But he, he was the one that basically put this measure together. Measure he before, is. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding you were just on the other side of the. I'm on the other side of that. On the other side of this deal. Okay, fine. All right, first off, talk a little bit about the, the whole issue of uh, this estate tax, kind of like its origin and. When, when, you know, how, did, how, did you, how did you get involved in this process? Well, that's different than the origin of the yeah, estate yeah, tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you so, know about that part, the origin? I, of, well, the, the uh, Oregon has had the estate tax longer than it's had an income tax. Wow. We've had the estate tax for 109 years. 109 years. 109 years. And the U.S. had the estate tax. Well, actually, the Greeks and Romans had estate taxes hmm. as well. But the U.S. has had the estate tax, and at first they brought it in when there was a war that had to be paid for, mm. and then it would go away whenever, when the emergency went away, mm. and then it became permanent, I think, about 100 years ago. But it wasn't a million dollars at that time when it first started. Oh, no. <laughs> no, of course <laughs> I just, not. I just, I just give it a say, wow, all this time, you've been hiding that money. Wow. In night, in the, you know, I don't know what the exemptions were before. Yeah, yeah. Um, my family had a farm, and when my brothers went back to be on the farm, the exemption was $60,000. 60000 okay, okay. And that was 1973 or so, uh -huh. 75 maybe. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's been, you know, the exemption has been raised a lot since okay. then. Okay. If the, if the uh, minimum wage had been raised the way the exemption was mm. raised, wow. people would be paying, getting paid a lot Boy, better. I tell you <laughs> a that. minimum wage ah. worker would be making about so, 60000 so, a year. So basically, they were, when they first started, they were basically going around passing the hat to the farmers, so to speak, right? <laughs> right. Well, so probably because a, a lot of people were involved in farming, right, right, but exactly. also the people who were uh, you know, making uh, clothing and mm -hmm. and steel and all mm -hmm. the all of the mm -hmm. industries, mm -hmm. whoever the owners were, right, right. that's Definitely. who they said, hey, we got to help out okay. Okay. because we got to pay for these wars. Right. So how do we get into eighty four now? Measure eighty four. What does that mean? Why did you get to the table? Why did you so Measure 84 is Kevin Mannix's idea of mm -hmm. how to solve a, a problem. I don't know what the problem really is. Mm -hmm because the estate tax is probably the most progressive part of our tax system uh, because only you know a couple needs more than two million dollars to be subject to the estate tax so the top two percent are the only estates that pay mm -hmm. in Oregon and um, how much of a percentage is that how much do they tax on, on if, two million above, above that if well okay so million. say a couple has four million dollars okay. And what usually happens is the first person dies and they pass all their assets to their spouse. Okay. And what passes with them is their $1 million exemption. Mm -hmm. So when the second person dies, there's $2 million worth of exemption. And the uh, tax on the, uh, that remains would be about $205,000. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting $4 million, the kids would get $3,800,000. I see. Okay. Now, most people would say that's quite a blessing instead of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> because so. $3.8 million yes. is a lot that's of money, way. even if you have quite a few kids, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a huge blessing. And I got involved in the issue because, um, I, basically because I was incensed about the way farmers were being used as mm -hmm. the poster boys. Mm -hmm. And I've been working on keeping a, an estate tax in Oregon for almost 10 years. Oh, really? And, um, and also working at the federal level. And, and I feel that in um, call to be engaged because I'm aware of how much of the success of our family farm and the success of my assets in the stock market and mm -hmm. in venture capital mm -hmm. is based on living in this society. Mm -hmm. You know, if it hadn't been for rural electrification, there would have been no electricity on the farm I grew up on. Mm -hmm. And without trains and roads and a court system that you could trust and a banking system that you could trust, how would we have sold our crops? Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how would you sell tomatoes to Safeway if there was not a way to trust that you were going to get paid? Mm -hmm. And with one of our crops, we weren't paid about three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars well that ended up in bankruptcy court and that and we ended up getting paid mm -hmm. and it is that that structure of the society that makes success help you know, you, possible. The other, the other thing I was interested in about this piece is that what you just said 
President Obama was jumped on when he started talking about the idea that other entities basically helped the person to achieve certain levels. I went to public school. I went to public college. I worked in, in, in jobs where I got paid by the public, and I worked in private industry. And, you know, it's all a piece. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to um, see my grandchildren not get a good education, mm -hmm. and I don't want the nurses and doctors that take care of me to not have a good education. I mean, it's, we all need all of that. Mm -hmm. and, and so to think that, uh, that we shouldn't pay a tax if we've been blessed with a lot in our lives when we die it just doesn't make sense to me. Why do you me. think people feel that way though? Why, why, why don't they feel that way? They, they're, they're sitting they, 10, they, 15, 20 million dollars in the bank. And they, and they believe it's theirs. I yeah. think, you know, I've heard that the, um, from people who, who work in philanthropy, mm -hmm. that generally speaking the first generation really understands that they didn't make it on their own. Mm -hmm. I mean, our farm wouldn't have made it without our workers. But they didn't end up with more than a million dollars. And yet, the farm would not, absolutely would not have succeeded without them, right? And, um, and so the, the first generation usually understands it, and later generations have a harder time. Um, they, didn't, they weren't involved in the creation of it, so they, don't, they, they weren't noticing the ways in which the structures of society were there for them. So what is 84 doing? What, what, what is Kevin what, doing? What, what is Kevin Kevin's saying? doing is um, eliminating over the next few years the estate tax. So by January 1st, 2016, there would no longer be an estate tax in Oregon, which would cost us, at that point in time, $120 million a year. Cost $120 million? Like, that's how you, much the... That's, that's how, how much, much goes the, back into... Right, right now, okay. the estate tax brings in an average of $100 million a year. To the state coffers? To the state coffers. Okay, I see. And, and he'll argue that that's, it's, it's only 1.5% of the budget. Well, it's enough to pay for a week of education, mm -hmm. or 1,200 teachers, mm -hmm. or 64,000 people on the Oregon Health Plan, or 21 years of project independence so seniors can get the help to stay in their home. It's a, it's, a, it's a significant amount of money. There's many things that we don't do because we don't have $400,000 or $3 million. So it would, we would really feel it. And we already have like the second uh, shortest school year in the country. Now, we my, can't afford to lose right. more. It's my understanding you, you've been in certain, some debates with Kevin, right? I have. Talking this issue. Mm -hmm. What were some of his areas in terms of, hey, this is, why, this is why I'm introducing this, and this is why we need to get rid of the estate tax? What, what are some well, of his one of, the thing, one of the things he said um, when we were debating uh, last was that uh, a few years ago, some farmers came to him, and they were very concerned about the estate tax and how it was going to get in the way of their transferring the the farm from one generation to the next, and that that's why he brought this forward. But he knows full well that those same farmers went and talked to the legislature, and the legislature changed the law. Hmm. And if you're a farm family now, unless you're worth more than $30 million, mm -hmm. there are very few farm families that are right, worth right. more than $30 right, million. Right, right, right. The average farm in Oregon is worth uh, 900000 So, um, So there's no estate tax. They don't. They don't. They don't pay it. Almost right. no farms are paying no the state problem. tax anymore. So why? Wh wh where is he coming? From? I think he makes his living this way. Okay. I'm I don't know problem. what else. I don't know what else to <laughs> think, because it so doesn't make sense. He's certain people. Are, have, they, have they signed off in terms of? He he's got uh, gone around and gotten a lot of chambers of commerce and a lot of farm bureaus to sign on and in support, and. Um, and that, you know, he's raised money with them, and he probably has national money coming, too. We know that a national group that's been fighting to kill the estate tax for a long time mm -hmm. funded a study that, that he's using. Um, but, you know, he, he, it's, it's interesting because the last few times around, his measures have wanted more government money to put more people in jail. Mm -hmm. And this one will give us less money so we'll ha have to be leaving people out of jail, possibly, mm -hmm. or you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. Who knows where the legislature mm -hmm. would not spend the money? But um, 
I, I think it's how he makes a living. How have how, how we, how we, we gotten to the point where we're not recognizing some of the issues that we're having in this country in terms of people who don't have as much, uh, the lack of education, which is very, the criminal justice system, just on and on and on. And we're having tough times trying to raise the funds, if you will, to counter that, i.e., whether it be through education, right? Making right. sure you're feeding the poor and, well, well basically feeding folks who are unemployed. That's what right, that's what we're, well, yeah. that's mostly what we're doing. That's basically, yeah. yes, yes. I, you know, somehow government started being vilified in the 80s and it, it, it just keeps being vilified. Mm. You know, I mean, I, we all see some government waste, but if you go into any private business, you see private business waste too. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I mean, in my refrigerator, there's waste. There's food that I don't get around to eating. We all waste. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't think when we're laying off thousands of teachers, mm -hmm. we, we think that there's a whole lot of waste left. And we all you know? benefit from government. We all benefit from government. We all, regard. If you, you don't get up in the morning with that. You're driving on the freeway, uh, whatever. You, you pick do, up the breathe phone. Breathe in the air. Breathe and in the air. <laughs> you're right. eating the food. I mean, we're all beneficiaries. Right. Why don't we recognize that? I, I don't know. You know, I was at a conference once where they asked us to write down all the government services mm -hmm. we had used really? at the beginning of the you know, 9 o'clock right. program. Right. And, of course, we... People had used the phone, they had taken showers with clean water, they'd breathed clean air, they'd used public transit to get to the, from their hotel to the conference. They were in a building that had probably been subsidized to, because it was a conference center, and they generally are. And that, you know, there, it, there are mirrored ways in which, you know, we're using a Visa card. We can trust that it's going to work because there's government rules about that. And, um, but we forget. I think we just forget. And those of us who have wealth actually use government more mm -hmm. than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we, ho we hope that we don't need the service, but it's there. You know, when you invest your mo money, you hope that some crook isn't going to take it and run. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, you're trusting the system to work mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the benefits really flow to those who have assets greater than they do to the welfare queen that people like to bring mm -hmm. up as mm -hmm. who's on the dole. Yeah, it's very know? strong you make that because even in the education system, you know, uh, you hear this business about uh, the charter school and then public schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always maintained that if something is wrong with something, fix it. Get in there and fix it. Mm -hmm. Don't run away from it and create something to counter. I mean, people go to school, they've got degrees along that program. and. They got to, I mean, on and on and on. You've got to give those form, those formative years a solid education for young for folks. For, yeah. Just like on the other end, for mm -hmm. seniors, for those who didn't go to the Harvards, if you will, of the world, if you will, but they made the, they, they 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 worked hard. They paid into the system. Now they're 65 or 70 years old. They should at least have a roof over their head, clothing on their back, food and health care. Feel like feeling Why secure. They, and people just don't. We just don't. We just don't see that, especially nice. the people in that upper crust. Yep. They, they seem to think that everybody else is a taker and they're a winner. And not, that's not true of everybody, yeah, no, no, no. but it's true of, a, of a, a lot of people, it seems. I'm proud of all the Oregonians who have been speaking up and yeah. saying, yeah. you know, I need to pay more taxes. There's a new business group called the Equity Alliance of Oregon, and they're business people who are saying, tax me more. Mm -hmm. I'm, I need a state that has adequate resources. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing now isn't adequate. Tell me this. Now, there's another piece to um, Mannix's bill mm -hmm. he, um, that David talks about in his op-ed. He, um, he, in the, the measure, there's a definition of what is a death tax. Mm -hmm. And included in a death tax is any intra-family transfer. Well, I saw that, yes. So uh, how that... What, th what that means is, mm -hmm. for instance, suppose I have, an, an, a, say, a piece of rental property, mm -hmm. and I've owned it for a long time, and it has a lot of, it's increased in value mm -hmm. a lot. And if I sold it myself, I would have to pay $40,000 worth of tax. Mm -hmm. But if I sell it to my son, and he gives me an IOU for the value of the property, I don't have to pay any tax on it. And there's nothing to keep him from turning around and selling it. And so then he can sell it 
pay off the IOU, and I've avoided forty thousand dollars in taxes. Wow. And it just like we don't need these kind of loopholes. And of course, most capital gains is earned by. The same people who pay the yeah. estate tax. Seventy-five percent of capital gains is earned and, by the and, top and as you say, percent. People who are in, in, in good means, if you will, uh, have the, the money, if you will, can hire their accountants and their attorneys and whatever to be able to counter that stuff. We we just we just had a point now. No, most of, a number of folks at that level just don't want to pay rent. Yeah, that's right. We just don't want to pay rent. People yeah. don't want to pay rent, and the people down below are just. I mean, it's, it's just really it's a tough that, situation. It, it, it is, because it's, it's making it hard for us to provide the ladder of success for future generations. Okay. You've got about two minutes. What, now, what about support? Do you have the, the endorsements are running around. Is the Oregonian going to endorse this piece or what? The Oregonian hasn't taken a position yet. Taken a position. a number of newspapers have, have started taking positions, but well, what's it, what's they seem to be uh, kind of standing back from it. A lot of them still, like, we're waiting to see what the movement is going to do. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely coalitions of people working to defeat it, mm. and I certainly hope we will. Well, tell me this, Jody. I mean, I know I, I'm good, good this morning, but I want to make sure I got this down to those basic you did real well. Uh, how do they? Uh, how do we get in touch with you to be supportive of this kind of, this campaign? They would uh, just Google Tax Fairness Oregon. That's the name of the, our, our organization. Okay. Just okay. Google Tax Fairness Oregon, and they'll go right to our website, okay. or go to our Facebook account. Both of them have been talking about this a lot. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right then. I think you, you really bring something to the table that's very important, and, and even to those folks who are basically supporting this. I hope that the, what we've shared with what you've shared with them today. They can really sense what the what the what the real issues are. I think that a lot of people don't really understand mm -hmm. who pays the estate tax. They don't understand that a couple needs more than two million dollars, right. okay, and not very many of us have no, that. No, no, and know. even those people that have more than two million dollars, mm -hmm. they don't pay that much. Yeah. I mean, if, if a four million dollar estate only pays two hundred and five thousand dollars, right. then it isn't. It is not making it impossible. Those the heirs can sell something. They can get a mortgage on the house that's fully paid off. They could. They've got many options. Mm -hmm. And if there's a small business involved, they can pay the tax over 14 years. Mm -hmm. So there's many ways to that the the tax structure is sensitive to the issues of people. So percentage wide in Oregon, what, what do you think percentage wide? Two, about two percent. About just two percent. About every year, 32,000 people die, and about 700 of them pay the estate tax. Is that right? 32,000. Wow. 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 Well, Jody, thank you very much. This has been really good. It's been enlightening, and I mean, it's been open. I mean, and again, thanks to Dave for putting that article out there like that. Yes. And I would recommend very strongly that you pick up the Oregonian and, and read the article. It's a good one. Clueless in Oregon, Measure 84, Suspicious Death Case Without Case Without a Body. It was funny how he made this funny. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's yeah. hard yeah. for me to be funny about this, but yeah. he did. Yeah. He's got good back. Yeah. Folks, thank you very much for being with us this Sunday, and uh, hopefully you join us next week, and we'll have another good, very interesting show. Jody, thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. All right, same